now. Here comes a charming young lady. Uh, excuse me, miss. Oh, hello. Hello. Tell me, how do you cope with the British weather? Oh, I'm very lucky, really. You see, my boyfriend's a weather forecaster. When I was at boarding school, we were allowed to watch him on television every Saturday, every week. If he tells you to take things off, you know you're in for a hot time. Oh, you are awful. But I like you. <laughs> he used to make me feel closer to him, and all the girls in my... My dormitory in form used to sit with me. My name's Scroosby, and this is Gaylord, my son. Yeah. And this is my dad, Cyril. And his mum calls him Fat Bum. <laughs> I used to feel a bit embarrassed about it, but I just used to get on with it. And, of course, I was very proud of him. He used to make me laugh. Tell the silly old man, keep coming out with these awful boobs. <laughs> From about 64 to 1981 or thereabouts, he was one of the biggest things on television. He was kind of Mr. Saturday Night. Despite being only five foot four, he was huge. I think there's more of Dick Emery in modern comedy than people realise. And they don't realise it because he's not repeated. If he was repeated, I think there would be a whole generation of people that would go, oh, Little Britain. Oh, hello, Honky Tonks, how are you? Nice to see you. Off to play around. Good heavens, no, I had enough of that last night. The Fast Show. Catherine Tate, all those characters and character comedians and sketch shows can trace them all back to Dick Emery. That and the shove the air forward like that. He was a good character actor. He could assume a character. I've watched him assume characters. You know, he'd put makeup on, the stage makeup of, say, Lampwick, and you'd see him become Lampwick. And you shove the old cat on and you immediately become Mr. Lampwick. Or the bother boy, or whoever, you know, the wig would go on, and suddenly it was, yeah, Dad, all right, yeah, that's fine. Dad, I, I think, think I've got, got it, it wrong, wrong again. again. <laughs> or the vicar with the two bless you, my son, and all that, it was away. The, the Dick Emery show, of course, uh, yeah. has been enormously successful. It's uh, been going since 1963 well, years. Yeah. There was a reason why kids in the 70s liked it, because it was broad, it was easy to sum up, um, and it was all based on catchphrases. One of the most important and significant things that Dick Emery has brought to comedy, particularly British comedy, was the importance of the catchphrase and the familiarity of the catchphrase. <laughs> Excuse me, that. Miss, uh, miss, are you going on holiday? Yes, I'm going to Bogovia in South America. If it starts with the, just the little, you know, hello, madam, miss. You know, it's, it's something as simple as that, and you go, oh, Oh, here she is. <laughs> they have wild parties and drinking in the streets. No woman is safe. You're liable to get seized by some brawny great South American and dragged off into the hills. That's terrible. Mm. Aren't you afraid? Oh, definitely. I'm afraid it might be all over by the time I get there. <laughs> I'm looking for a national <laughs> And then she lunges. So you can see the pattern. You can see exactly how he's going to do it. But it's done with such precision every time that you just can't help but go, ah, oh, bring her back. What else? What else? What else is she going to do? That's the amazing thing about Dick Emery is that he, he created these characters and he carried on doing them for, for year after year after year. And people never really tired of it. The power of a catchphrase is the fact that you know you're going to laugh. You just know it, and you're waiting for it. Essentially, a catchphrase in itself is not, is not funny, but you repeat it enough times, and that's all people want to hear. I'll bet you get plenty, eh? Have you? <laughs> now and again. Oh. oh, you are all. <laughs> but I like you. <laughs> I'm sure you got sick of who you are awful being shouted at him from across the street by random people. Um, but that's that's the power of a catchphrase. You know, that's what you do it for. You you want that that signifier with your audience. Put on the wig like that to see me become. Hello. Oh, you are awful, but I like you. <laughs> if you just keep doing the same thing week in week out, you have this reaction from the audience of. OK, he's there, he's going to do the thing that he did last week. Ah, he's done it. That's funny. There are times where I've just sort of pulled a catchphrase out of the, the air or a little saying or something, and it, everyone suddenly laughs and it's all OK again. <laughs> so that's quite a nice thing. I must say I'm fascinated by your upper register. Pardon? <laughs> and at the bottom, you're beautifully rounded. 
<laughs> you are awful. But I like you. There is always a danger. You, you end up in a trap of your own making. Hello, Honky Tonks. How are you? Nice to see you. You know, I remember doing the Fast Show live, and you really did get that sense that what the audience wanted from you was to come on, do your catchphrase, and then bugger off and bring on someone else to do their catchphrase. Dick Emery was an innovator. His show used a familiar TV device to find his cast, the Vox Pop. We thought it would be a frightfully good idea to go out of the street with a camera and uh, take some movie pictures of various characters and ask them what their idea was of show business. Excuse me, officer, we're asking about show business. Oh, well, I like a good television show myself, you know, Zed Cars, that's pretty good. What's going on with the Vox Pop? is really interesting there, because the Vox Pop has been part of the, of the fabric of television for quite a while by this point. He was so clever to come up with the idea of using Vox Pops that were mostly really only used in news shows at that time to introduce all of his characters. That was just a, genius, a stroke of genius, because that's where the love of the characters comes in. Well, after our day's work, it's they up to take your mind off your job. <laughs> But what he's really good at is observing how members of the public behave, how that generation unfamiliar with being filmed, how they react to the camera. And I think it's brilliantly observed. Excuse me, may I bother you? Yes, but don't be rough. <laughs> What's your favourite form of entertainment? Well, I like going to the pictures myself. I go every week with my boyfriend, too. We've got Hetty and Mandy. They're fully formed, really, in their first appearance. But I think because of, of our familiarity with them, I think we forget in a way how precisely observed that relationship with the camera and the member of the public is. But I like you. <laughs> Dick Emery was born into show business. His parents were a popular double act on the cabaret circuit and their young son went with them. What did they call themselves? Uh, they called themselves Callan and Emery. My mother's maiden name is Callan. She's Irish, you see. Yeah. They did a double act for years. They went all over the, all over the world. They were quite famous, but they still had to work very hard and go from train to train to bus to whatever and live in digs, and it wasn't easy. In 1914, grandmother Bertha uh, became pregnant, and they carried on doing the act together. And um, she announced one night, I feel the child coming on, and uh, she went to University College Hospital and gave birth to a Richard Gilbert Emery. The marriage uh, broke down fairly soon after, and I think my grandfather, Laurie, uh, Lawrence Emery, um, left the family in a fairly dramatic way. Father was a bit of a, a, bit of a lad. Father was a bit of a, you know, he liked the old, and the, uh, uh, she didn't think that was the sort of life for me. Apparently, uh, he was playing under the kitchen table, and his mum was there, and then his dad walked in, and he had a little wooden toy, and his dad lifted up the tablecloth, and they, I don't know if they had a row or something, but said to Dick that, who do you want to be with, me or your mum? And he had to make that choice, which I think really affected his life, so, and he chose to be with his mum. Despite a difficult childhood and a poor education, Dick had set his heart on the stage, a rarefied stage, the opera. I studied operatic singing before the war, and the war came and sort of rather ruined all my chances of becoming a, a really tip-top operatic singer, which I wanted to be. I mean, he was fascinated by singing and was going to go to Italy uh, in 1939. Um, but the war came along and he never went. And though he carried a love of opera to his dying day. Dick was 24 when war broke out. He volunteered for the RAF, excited by the prospect of learning to fly. They gave me a form and I filled the form in and uh, I said, pilot or nothing. <laughs> he desperately wanted to be a pilot and couldn't because he didn't have any of the qualifications. He didn't understand trigonometry. Maths were a complete unknown to him. Tell me, how many degrees are there in a right angle? <laughs> I don't know. He was actually put into the kitchen and he had to peel potatoes by the ton. And 
He tried all sorts of different ways of becoming a pilot, but nothing worked and he was still peeling potatoes. Dick was grounded. To amuse himself, he put on shows for his mates. St. Devil in Cornwall was my first station, and I used to sing there and did a little bit of comedy. Even better, he was in love and quickly married. It wouldn't be the last time. Wife number one was a glamorous dancer who went by the name of Zelda. Things were going well until the money ran out, and that is the cause of a lot of his problems. He was always running out of money. There'd been a slight cock-up with his marriage allowance, and uh, it was going to his mother and not to his wife. And she wrote to him saying, me and your son are starving. Help. Dick was desperate to make some money for his wife and new son. What he did next was extraordinary. He deserted the RAF and joined a West End show, cunningly using his mother's maiden name. So when he should have been on an RAF base, he was actually um, in the Merry Widow uh, at Her Majesty's. He was in the chorus with a whole lot of other people. They all got beards and things on, and, they, and he thought he felt quite safe behind the beard, and they thought, well, nobody's going to recognise me here, I'll be OK. He was about to go on stage one night, and two men arrived wearing big overcoats and big shiny shoes. And, uh, Richard Callan, yes, also known as Air Craftsman, and rattled off his service number. Richard Gilbert Emery, yes, you're coming with us, son. And they, took, they arrested him on the side of the stage. He stayed away long enough for it to become proper desertion and not just being absent without leave. It had all gone terribly wrong. Dick was sent to prison. He had fled the Air Force for his family, and now his wife had fled him. I think Zeldra got fed up and eventually ran off with a GI and went to America. So he never saw his firstborn and um, never saw Zeldra again either. I think he must have loved her because it was his first, his first wife, you know. But I think he must have felt hurt that she went off with this American. He didn't speak about it very much and he never got in contact until Gil contacted him. But um, I think it must have affected him. A spell behind bars was a long way from the opera in Italy. But Dick's luck got better, thanks to a man called Ralph Reeder. One particular day in 1943, you were holding auditions for a show, and a crowd of eager young airmen turned up to be heard. Among them was a somewhat dividend AC2, whom you eventually took on. Now television's own Dick Emery. Did, did times change, in fact, for the better? Oh, yes. He's the entertainment officer on our camp. He called me into his office one day and he said, Emery, you'll have to remuster to a different trade, you know. So I said, well, what shall I do? He said, well, why don't you join the RAF gang show? So I did. And you were sent to Ralph? Yes. Who was like a ray of sunshine, you know, in the dark cloud of the ordinary rat. And that was when he really came to life in, uh, in the military. And he was happier, much happier. Did you find that other servicemen who came to see you thought that you were not really working? They'd say, uh, is this all you do then? Just a show at night like that? i say, yeah. Well, don't you do any guard duties or anything like that? No, no, no. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. Neither could we. It was really lovely. They didn't have to get up very early in the morning. They could have their hair a little bit longer. The uniforms had been tailored. It was all much better for Dick, much more uh, sociable and palatable for, for his wants and needs. So the gang show is the perfect uh, test bed, really, for Dick Emery's characters. And some of those that we were very familiar with from the shows of the 60s and 70s did grow from the gang shows. In the RAF gang shows, it was all men, so they had to dress up as women. You had Dick Emery completely comfortable dressing up as a woman, even though he was, you know, pretty much the most robustly heterosexual man in show business. Um, and also very, very comfortable camping it up and playing, you know, those sorts of characters. And it's very interesting, I think, that he should choose to, 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 to make his debut in this kind of acting style with a character called Vera Thin who was a, a parody of Vera Lynn. Um, so sending up the force's sweetheart. Now, you see that polka dot dress? That's me. That's how Amanda started. There she is. Silly old bag. Excuse me, are there any seats left for tonight? 
Oh, yes, miss. I think you should be all right. Oh, I'm so glad. I've never missed a performance of the Maestros. Really? I'm his greatest fan. Wherever he goes, I follow. Then you must have seen his cursy fan tutti many times. You are awful. But I like you. The whole of Gang Show, you know, you're always inventing all the time. And at the stall was a carpenter by the name of Bert Dent. And he was a lampwick. <laughs> the bravest act I ever did was one day in Regent's Park when I saved the life of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Cut! So I... We are not interested in your ridiculous rambling. And everybody in Gang Show, would all, we were all talk to each other as lampwick. I think the war runs through everything he does. Hey, right, hey, right, right. And, and also because of, of national service, there was a familiarity of, with that in the audience too. They shared a kind of humour that never really left them. Two pieces forward, arch! Open, doors! Come you doors, mount! <laughs> doors, wait for it, wait for it! <laughs> We're a long way from the war here, and yet the, the tone of it, I don't think really changed very much from the 1940s. He didn't like authority particularly, and he liked to buck against authority, but he would take characterization from the sergeant or the sergeant major or whatever, and that, that whole sort of thing of being against authority, that comes from those military days. There is something about people who take themselves too seriously that's funny anyway. And the fact that he played them with such conviction is why you loved them. There are lots of uh, sketches that, that not just send up the war, but send up representations of the war. There's a kind of great escape sketch. Tunnel B is being dug under. Uh, under the bathhouse, sir. Under the bathhouse. Tunnel C is being dug under. Under the cookhouse, sir. The cookhouse, yes. And tunnel is? Uh, under the... <laughs> After the war, Dick Emery returned to London, his act honed by countless RAF gang shows. He looked for a West End stage to join and found one, the toughest stage in town. Of course, Emery, like so many of his generation, uh, did an apprenticeship at the Wimble Theatre. This is the home of the famous Windmill Girls, and a feature of the house is its continuous performance. Many a stage star graduated at the Windmill. It was a tremendously hard training ground for comedians because the audience really weren't there for the comedy. Let's not, you know, let's not gloss over this. The Windmill was really sleazy. It was a mixture of comedy and um, tableau vivant. Um, which sounds very academic, but actually is strippers who don't take their clothes off and who don't move. The law was that no female was allowed to uh, move. You know, if she, if she were nude, she had to stay still. There's an interesting connection historically between stand-up comedians and strippers and vaudeville workers and burlesque dancers and often they shared the same stage and came up together and, and comedy and strippers was a sort of night out. And of course that was the great appeal. It was the only place in London where you could see an entertainment like that. And notoriously some people would bring along pea shooters and fire them um, at the women performing on stage hoping to to make them move and, you know, and, and, and break the law. He said, when the girls were on, everybody was looking up. When the girls came off and he came on, everybody looked down, went, read their newspapers or went to sleep. There was a thing called the Windmill Steeplechase. If a seat was vacated, there would be this mad rush to jump over from the rows behind and get into that seat, uh, but never, never for a comedian. And I used to have to stand there for at least two minutes while the audience settled themselves to get closer. <laughs> <laughs> If you could score big laughs at the windmill, you could get laughs anywhere. Um, you know, Morecambe and Wise lasted a week there, um, and they were told in the middle of the week, oh, no, we're not picking out the option on the second week. It was a really tough gig. Dick survived the windmill and built a reputation as a comic actor. Another flag there? Yes, it's in aid of the poor and needy. Jolly good. 
Do you often do this sort of thing? No, it's my first time. I'm very shy. Only my boyfriend said I should do it because it's in a good cause. Ah, he put his finger on your soft spot, did he? <laughs> well, you can't go through life without having some fellow feeling. <laughs> awful. But I like you. People like to call me a, a female impersonator, you see, which I'm not. Mm. I, I like to be called a, a character actor, and that is one of my characters. Yes. And I would hate to be sort of, I would hate my career to sort of hang on the fact that I can put on a wig and anybody can put on a female wig and get a laugh. Well, if you look at the fact that he's created so many different women and they are so distinctive, you know, normally if, if men kind of, if they dress up for panto or if they just even are in drag and doing something funny, you'd expect them to get one character just bang on and you'd be like, oh yeah, he can do woman really well. But no, he had three and four and five different female characters that was so distinctive. I just think it was, an, it was natural to him. It was the walk, the mannerisms. He just, it just came to him naturally, I think. Are you married? No. Oh, good. Look, I'm looking for a lovely young man. Oh, well, that's... <laughs> I think his strength was the breadth of what he could do, because the characters were distinct. You knew it was him. You could see it was him. But they each had a life of their own. You've got Mandy. The interviewer asks her something and she assumes it's a sexual reference. What are you going to give your boyfriend for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> what? You are awful. I like you. The first time he ever did that character, she just gently taps his cheek and you look over the years, it sort of develops into a prod and a push and by the end, it's really giving some people some very hefty shoves. For an attractive young lady, you surprised me. You drove like a man. Oh, thank you. Apart from your two big boobs. Oh, you are awful. <laughs> but I like you. I just find it hilarious every time he does it. The power and the force of it is just very funny. <laughs> I wonder how many thousands of times he actually did that. I would have thought that one or two people here were ripe for characterization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there was a lady here who was a secretary, bless her heart, and she was a very nervy lady. And I, I always thought she, she was a little deprived of the, uh, <laughs> the opposite sex. Hence, Hetty. Excuse me, officer. Yes, madam. Miss. Sorry, miss. I'd like to report to the man just burst through my kitchen door and startled me. Yeah, you describe what he was like? Well, he was tall, blonde, about 22, and had blue eyes and was very tanned. All right, we'll try and find him. If you do, tell him I'm home all day tomorrow. It's very funny because if you looked at Dick, you didn't think, oh, you're feminine in any way. But when he portrayed them, he did become feminine and sort of believable as characters. And Hetty, believable as a character. And you, and you did relate, you know, there would be someone in, in your group that was looking for a man and so, but just taking it to, he just took it to the nth degree, he took it another step further. Their voices were so distinctive. You, if you don't even watch it and you just hear it on radio, you'll go, oh, he's doing Hetty. Oh, he's doing Beatty. Oh, he's doing, you know, Mandy, whatever. He's doing all these different characters because it was the detail in which he created all these different people. And that is difficult to do. I think perhaps we should introduce ourselves. I'm Phoebe Fairhurst. I miss snogging. <laughs> so do I, but we're both over 30. He loved women and he impersonated women. Strange that, isn't it? But it's true, yes. He was the archetypal funny woman. After a show, he turns into the butchest man you've ever seen. Right, we're going to the Italian restaurant, but don't bring that Jess Conrad. All the birds love Jess Conrad. He's a fanny magnet, don't bring him. Dick Emery became a notorious womanizer, but that reputation went back way before he was famous. By 1950, he had divorced Irene, wife number two. Next was Iris. She and Dad hit it off because they shared the same sense of humour, same sense of the ridiculous. They were like peas in a pod. They, they just, you know, clicked. Iris duly became the third Mrs Emery and mother to Nick. But a new wife and child didn't satisfy Dick's lust for love while he was away. I met him 
as the star comedian in a summer show. And that's how we met um, in Lowestoft. Dad was at that time having an affair um, around the time I was born. And then when we got back, he called me to meet him in London and he'd hired a room at the Dolphin Square and I was taken up there and that's where I lost my virginity. <laughs> <laughs> at 17. My parents were beside themselves because they were only five years older than Dick. I went into the bathroom and he's packing up his wash bag, which he did when he was going on tour. Where are you going, Dad? You know, oh, I'm going, where are you going? I'm going a long way away. In fact, he wasn't. He was going down to Cobham, seven miles away. Ten years of back and forth followed. Vicky, then Iris, Iris, then Vicky. In my first year at... Um, boarding school, um, he took back, went back to my mother. They wrote me a joint letter on one occasion. We're back together, we're going to be a family again. He said he'd left Iris, but I think it was still, you know, behind the scenes. And then two months later, it was off. Then it was on again, then it was off again. Then it was on again, then it was off. He felt so guilty about Iris. He was always trying to get back to me. And after the last time, I wrote a letter. Dear father, go away. I think that's the nicest way I can put it. Eventually, Dick plumped for Vicky, wife number four, and mother to son number three. But it wasn't the end. Here, here, now I'm looking for my bird. You're not... Your bird? Yeah. What does she look like? I haven't picked her up yet. <laughs> but there must be one for me in Yarmouth somewhere. I went to the dressing room with, with Michael in a carry cot because the cast wanted to meet. And I must have turned up probably 15 minutes early. Went to the dressing room and the door was locked. Couldn't get in. And his manager came tearing up the passage saying, darling, come to the bar and have a drink with me and we'll see Dick in a minute. But of course he was, he had a chorus girl in there. So it was ongoing, you know. But the next day I had the most beautiful bracelet, gilt present. <laughs> Vicky has this feeling that he always had to have at least two women in his life. One to act as an anchor and one that uh, was the fun wife. Vicky had a daughter, Eliza, but there were more. I think he just got obsessed with women, fell in love very quickly, and then thought, oh no, I'll, I've married her, I'll go and get another lady, because I'm a bit bored here, possibly, and then um, go on to the next one. Next was Josephine Blake, a dancer. Vicky knew her. We happened to meet in the loo, and I said, oh, hi, Joe. how are you? And she couldn't look at me. And we both went to our handbags and we both pulled out the same perfume. And I thought, strange. Anyway, two weeks later, he was off with Joe. We've got Dick's adopted East End kids over for the day and we've something special for them. Dick, lunch is ready. <laughs> Roast ribs of beef and bistro gravy, of course. Brown seasons and thickens. Joe Emily knows what every mum knows. For your bistro kids, there's only one gravy. What about your eggs? What about my trousers? Oh, <laughs> you're awful. Bye -bye. I like you. Joe married Dick and they never divorced, but inevitably he had one last partner, Faye. Hey, can I book a car here? Yeah? A car, sir? Yes. Oh, I'm afraid I've just locked up. Oh, damn. Dick was working at Ealing Film Studios recording one of his shows, and I don't think I'd got more than one line or something. American Express. <laughs> that should do nicely, sir. <laughs> and at the end of it, I was just going out home, and there was this handsome, clean, silver-haired, beautifully white-teethed man standing there saying, oh, hello, we want a lift. And I thought, well, why not? So I said yes. He was in love with being in love and um, in love with the chase and irresistible, probably, to anybody he was chasing. The wives came and went, but he was always faithful to one woman, his mum. He married his mother, basically, because he was looking after her and then used to look elsewhere for a bit of fun. <laughs> he really admired his mother. He talked about her a lot. I think she's probably quite domineering. You know, possibly that's why he 
uh, liked lots of different women in his life. Maybe he was just looking for someone like his mother and maybe he just didn't find that. I'm engaged. Engaged to Dennis? Oh, I am happy for you. She didn't want any women in his life at all. She wanted, you know, possess him. It was not very healthy for Dick, really, at all. Dick Emery's star status meant his love life became the stuff of tabloid headlines. But fame came late in life. For many years, he acted in the shadow of others, a supporting role for friends he knew from the wartime gang shows and from the glamour shows of the Windmill Theatre. When Dick was at the windmill, he was friends with Tony Hancock, and uh, sometimes he would be invited round to Tony Hancock's flat, uh, which had nothing in it at all. Um, it had a, a high mantelpiece with a couple of tins of baked beans on it, and um, that was about it, and a bed with no bedclothes on it. Uh, no chairs, I used to sit on the floor. And then Dick got the audition at the, at the windmill, and he was earning a bit of money, obviously, and Tony was out of work, so he handed Tony some money to go and get his shirts laundered. Those times when Dick had said, look, here, have a few quid, uh, when he was on his uppers, Hancock repaid him by saying, I know just the person who can play the postman or the milkman or whatever, and get Dick onto TV. Afternoon, postman, come to empty the box. Hey, Ed. Oh, well, there's no need to put these through. They can go straight in the sack. They can't. <laughs> they can't? No, 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 no. You see, my job is collecting letters from the pillar box. I'm not allowed to put any letters in my sack that haven't passed through the slit. I love seeing, seeing a spark between people when they work together. For me, that's half the fun. <laughs> I think there's a real visible warmth between Hancock and, and Dick Emery. Um, on screen and how they enjoy each other's company. You are uh, up holding and obstructing Her Majesty's mail. Both of them were terrible corpses. They were always laughing when they shouldn't have been laughing. It just shows the love that you have for each other when you're working with each other to, to enjoy whatever that moment was that nobody else will be party to, but they know there's something there. Are you going to take my letters or are you not? I am not. It was notoriously difficult to be Pat Hancock's co-star. He got rid of people who he thought were too threatening. He got rid of Sid James. You're a mate of mine. If I can't help you, then I wouldn't be much good, would I? <laughs> when they made you, they threw away the mold. I mean that. <laughs> but I think with Emery, Hancock's got somebody who is a friend, who likes him, who doesn't threaten him, and who he can enjoy himself with rather than feel like he's going to be upstaged by. Well into his 30s and 40s, Dick Emery was still to break through with his own shows. Tony Hancock became a star on television, but now he would get his chance through his mates who were making their names on the radio. Dick was very much part of the, uh, the circle that included the goons and Michael Benteen. They would all meet together at the Grafton Arms in uh, London, in Victoria. It was a safe haven for jobbing or out of work comedians you know so milligan sellers seacombe michael benteen eric sykes they would all gather together huddle over a pint and try and make it last all evening and meet up in the top room as well and start writing and throwing ideas around with each other the initial goon shows were um private parties upstairs for friends in the pub and Emery was there. I mean, they were hilarious together. They really were. And Spike was a nutcase. <laughs> he was a nutcase. And Peter Sellers was... It, he wanted to be the star. Whenever Harry Seacombe was ill on The Goon Show, uh, they called Dick Emery in, and they called him Emery-type sea goon. In the mid-50s, the goons made a, a short film called um, The Muckinese, The Case of the Muckinese Battlehorn. Um, for which uh, Harry Seacombe wasn't available. And in comes Dick Emery to deputise. He's very much on a par with Sellers. There's only three of them in it, and great characters, and you can see his acting shining through. Is there, are you there? Are you the body? No. Are you? Oh, no. I'm Superintendent Quilt of Scotland Yard. Delighted to meet you. My name's Nodule. I'm the curator here. How do you do? <laughs> How do you do? There's a scene where he's playing a character called Molly's Ponk, 
who's uh, trying to get uh, house insurance, uh, which has just run out, and it's just a monologue to camera. Straight to the camera. I live in a little log cabin in Piccadilly. Last night, I left a burning cigarette by my bedside and the old place was burnt down. And the night before last, my fire insurance ran out. And we did not get a penny. My, how we did laugh <laughs> when we <laughs> heard about it. <laughs> uh, Mr Park has nothing to do with our story. We thought you'd like to see what a real idiot looked like. It's so beautifully observed, that sort of 30 seconds of performance. So he's a, he, he, he can more than hold his own with Peter Sellers. The goons were pivotal in changing the way that comedy was just accepted and, you know, uh, seen by new audiences. The fact that he was associated with them says something. But he's not just taking over parts that would have been played by Seacombe. He's also taking over parts that are Peter Sellers' material, recycled from old episodes of The Goon Show. So there's a scene where a janitor is questioned, and it's a bit of The Goon Show, lifted straight out of an episode about the stealing of Number 10 Downing Street, um, and it's a character that Peter Sellers used on that show. Mr Cripp, would you like to tell us your story? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Hmm? Well... I was proceeding in an orderly manner towards the main gate last night in order to lock up. Yeah. When suddenly, somebody jumps out and wallops me on the head. Yeah? Yes, sir. Wallop, wallop, wallop on the head. I turn round and wallop, wallop, wallop again. Incredible. Down I go. And wallop, wallop, wallop on the head again. Then, just as I'm trying to get up, wallop, wallop, wallop. On your head? Yes, sir. Wallop. 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 Tell me, Mr. Crimp, did you notice anything peculiar about these men? Yes, sir. What? They kept on walloping me on me head. So there is Emery doing Peter Sellers. So there is this sense in which he can, you know, he can come in. He's like the swing dancer on a big West End show. He can come in and, you know, probably with almost no rehearsal at all, pick up the script and, and do what's required because he knows the work of those other people so well. Dick Emery was a go-to character actor each show developing the figures that would serve him well. Now he landed a big show, The Army Game. Towards the end of the run, 1960, they created this new character uh, called Private Chubby Catchpole. This, this character was quite camp, little chubby, um, squaddy character, and it was Marty Feldman that gave him the line, Hello, Honky Tonks, which really took off in the army game, and, and, and Dick Henry was, was bequeathed that by Marty Feldman to use as he wanted to. The 60s arrived, and so finally did Dick Emery. At last, he was in the right place at the right time with the right friends. He was doing more and more. And Michael Benteen said to the, uh, the bosses at the BBC, he needs his own series. And those were the days when they would take a punt on people, and so they did. So from, from all that sort of little bits of working with Tony Hancock and Peter Sellers and Michael Benteen, he got his own show. But it's a long old graft. He was the last one of that generation, really, to get his major, major break. Um, when he got it, you're going to grab onto that BBC contract and not let it go, you know. Dick was quite surprised, I think, when he got the offer from the BBC. He thought it would never come, and in fact, he was, I think, in his early... 40s before he even started. In 1963, Dick Emery got his own show at last. He was 48 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet some of the artists in my show tonight. He was always on the TV. And he was there from 1963 right through until he died in 83. So that was right through my formative years. At start, it was a variety show. So he'd come on as himself, say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Then there'd be a sketch, then there'd be a musical guest. There'd be a big number at the end. Dick became a really, really big star. Of course, one has to remember that there were only maybe three channels, but he had audiences of 21 million people. Good evening. It soon became apparent that the real strength of the Dick Emery show was his own comedy creations. Now their sketches became the show's sole focus. I just saw it like a, like a comic. 
it was like, you know, like the Beano or the Dandy to me, you know. So if you picked up the Beano and Dennis the Menace wasn't in there, you'd be really upset, right? So if you watched the Dick Henry show and there was no Vicar or no Bother Boys or, you know, you'd be really upset. So it was a weekly comic. It was Dick Henry doing these wonderful sort of gallery of grotesques. Mr, um, Mr, um... Lampwick, uh, James, <laughs> Maynard, <laughs> Kitchener Lampwick. I'm an old contemptible, yes. I was at the Dardanelles, I was. Yeah. Dick Henry was a great character actor. Those, those characters are all really strong. Um, his voice work was, was fantastic. He was very good at, uh, at creating a voice to go with the characters. It's the quality, it's the class of the work, the creations. You believed the creations he came up with. Yes? Good morning, young miss. Allow me to introduce myself to you, dear lady. I am Lancelot Castlemaine Orpington Pendrus, otherwise known as College. He told stories with um, College, whereas with a lot of the other characters, you know, you didn't really need to tell a story. They were established with Miss. What are you calling him Sir for? I'm sorry, Sergeant, but he sounds exactly like my father. Oh, really? <laughs> what was your mother's name? Oh, Anthea, actually. Anthea, actually. Yeah. <laughs> are you an Anthea, actually? She came from... Stop it, now, stop it. I'm telling you for the last time, College, if you're not off these premises in two minutes, I'm going to put you under arrest, and what am I saying? <laughs> he uses a prison cell as his own personal hotel because he's a clever man, and he can do that, and he can pull it off. And I can see why he might have thought that's his favourite character. What about the effect that uniforms have on people? You put a, a man in a, in a, a car park and give him a peat hat, he becomes powerful. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Can't come in here. <laughs> Well, that'll give them something to think about on their honeymoon, won't it? Are you married yourself, sir? No, I'm not. And according to all the motorists I knock off, neither were my mother and father. He had detail. And for me, comedy is always in the detail. And he had that in bucket loads. People have watched me in the dressing room getting him made up. And as I get made up, gradually I leave me and become the other person. He's a bit, you know, slow in his mind, you see. And then you can change that one, push the hair back, and put this cap on like this, you see, and become the... <laughs> Hello, how <laughs> are you, you know? Are the chaps ready? <laughs> I think any, anyone who does character comedy well will know, you, you know, that you, you, you kind of start... You st for me, it starts with the voice. As soon as I found the voice of the character, then I can, you know, get into... physically get into the character. And then the fun stuff is dressing them up. Probably halfway through the makeup. He would actually turn into that character and he would no longer talk to you as Dick. He would talk to you as Mandy or Vicar or whoever it was. And also, his hands changed shape. And he, if I could just look at his hands, I would know which character he was going to play because they literally, I don't know how he changed the shape of his hands, but they were absolutely different for each character. How big a part did these props play in the characters? Oh, they play a very big part. I mean, uh, props are, uh, are an essential. I mean, without them, uh, one feels almost naked, if you'll forgive the word. <laughs> he was a great character actor, but he knew the value of a prop. So with the skinhead, it was the ill-fitting denim and all that. With the vicar, it was the, the fearsome teeth. He knew how to use props brilliantly. Mm. It helps, you see, because when you put this prop on, you'll become... <laughs> <laughs> you must have the interests of the community very much at heart. Oh, I do indeed. For instance, on behalf of my flock, I've been keeping a critical eye on some of the scandalous strip clubs in our neighbourhood. And what are your conclusions? Well, for my money, you can't whack Miss Lulu and her trained python with the girl is galore. <laughs> so they have a walk, you know. Yeah. They have a walk. A walk, yes. Oh, yes. They are walking with God. Yes. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> he was taking the out of these people but there was nothing malicious about it. You know, Clarence, um, although problematic now um, in terms of the, the caricature it represents, it was actually based on a lot of Emery's theatrical mates from years back. I got a job in chorus, and this is where I learnt uh, one of my characters, because the entire chorus boys, all the, all the chorus boys, were all that bad. <laughs> and I think they sort of looked at it and laughed and saw themselves in that. How long have you been in ladies' hairdressing? Don't be daft, I'm in men's. <laughs> Clarence was very out, you know, there was no, he wasn't in the closet at all. He was very out there and not afraid to, uh, to say exactly 
who and what he was. And that was very bold to have a very openly out homosexual character in a family primetime TV show. That was very brave. Excuse me, sir. Oh, hello, honky tonks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Nice to see you. Are you uh, catching a plane today? Yes, I'm going to the United States. I used to go by line. Uh, such a shame they got rid of the Mary and the Elizabeth. Oh, yes. Mm. It was a pity oh, to yeah. see the old queens go. Oh, don't upset yourself. Love, I'm coming back. <laughs> The thing about looking at the, the, the Clarence character is how over the years the, the costumes got more and more outrageous and it really reminded me of Matt Lucas's Only Gay in the Village on that where he started as a, as a reasonably uh, realistic portrayal of a, of a gay man in a Welsh village and by the end he was wearing the most ridiculous costumes that he could get his hands on and, and Dick Emery was doing exactly the same thing. The honky-tonk character emerges just at a point when a certain kind of uh, gay stereotype is coming to the fore in comedy. Um, and often that's one that's, uh, that's created by gay performers. I mean, Larry Grayson is the, the most excellent example. <laughs> oh, I say, just look at that fool. What on earth does he think he looks like dressed in that ridiculous outfit? If I didn't know anything about Dick Emery, I think I might have surmised that he would... I would have thought he's probably gay, but has got a, has married someone just to cover it up. But that that is so far it seems to be very wide of the mark of what he actually was like. Was he was uh, something of a dirty old man, really, he was. wasn't he? Excuse me, can you tell me, are you married, sir? No, mate. I'll sooner have the bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not the same as having a little wife, surely. Ah, uh, listen, mate. You show me a bird, I can ride up the M1 and over a town, and I'll think. <laughs> about it. He was a biker, so you know he'd be up the Ace Cafe or whatever. And, you know, he, he wasn't a conventional figure. He was, a, you know, he was a theatrical. So it's my first day of rehearsals, I think, and he's dressed in red and black leather, head to toe. And I thought he'd done it for a gag. So I went... <laughs> oh, it's so funny! <laughs> there was a deathly silence and no-one said anything. And I went, oh, right. And it so happened that Dick liked motorbikes. And so he used to come to rehearsals on a motorbike, but I didn't know. I remember thinking, oh, please, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but he did look funny. <laughs> I thought it was a new comedy character. <laughs> Dick knew his audience. His characters were recognisable, believable, but now they became a burden. I think Dick's characters were a blessing and a curse in a way probably more of a blessing to start with and more of a curse to, to finish with. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, if he had wanted to do longer things exploring those characters, the problem was that they, they had become just atrophied into being caricatures, and you kind of think, well, what, you know, what depth could you, could you do with someone like Mandy? How do you develop that? Because Dick's characters were so well-known and because the public wanted them all the time, he couldn't get away from being Mandy and Lamprick and Vicar and all the others. Um, he tried really hard to, to move on. Sometimes he was almost in despair because he wasn't allowed to. The public would not let him. Here she is, Miss Mandy Dunnett. Tell me, I don't suppose this is the first title you've ever won? Oh, no, no, no. I was once the chemical closet queen of Kettering. <laughs> really? Yes. I sat on the throne for two consecutive years. <laughs> I heard an audience in Australia shouting for Mandy because Mandy wasn't in the show that night. And he suddenly had to go and unpack Mandy quickly and get into her and get on. It's nothing very clever. I don't like Mandy. No relation to you? Don't like her. Uh, yes. But we won't go into that. <laughs> We won't go into that. No, she's, uh, she's an old bag, you know. Dick had created TV monsters that were so loved, so vivid, that they eclipsed his own personality. The interesting thing about Dick Emery is, is he never really had a public persona. Dick couldn't be himself on television. He found it very difficult to be him. This chat on the BBC's Nationwide show reveals how much more comfortable he is being in character than being himself. Aren't you a bit old to be riding a motorbike? Old? Old? I'm 79 and a half. I'm 79 years and a half. His characters hid him, and I think that's why they were such good characters. Excuse the hair. 
And hello, honky tonk. <laughs> how are you? Hello. He couldn't actually come out and just be genuinely addressing the audience. And and you know maybe he was driven to to play those characters and to and to hide behind them. I think there's there's insecurities there. There's fear there of not you know being able to perform enough or be funny enough or to make an audience feel comfortable enough to watch you. I uh, had rather an, an odd upbringing, therefore I was rather an odd child. Mm -hmm. So therefore I became uh, a character actor because I found it easier to hide my identity behind a character. You're one of the few that would admit that, you know. Being in character is 100% the way to overcome your fears. I, I, I'm exactly like that. I love to. Do mind if I have a fag? <laughs> if I'm in character and I'm on stage, the real you is invisible. And so you feel free that you can just play and be that person, be that character. Dick Emery hid behind his characters, not to the same degree that Peter Sellers did. With Peter Sellers, he said, oh, I'm a completely blank canvas. When I'm not playing a character, I don't exist. There was a distinct entity called Dick Emery, who loved his fast cars, who had tremendous fun, who was just a life force. But he had, for years, terrible stage fright. Funnily enough, uh, although I was nervous, if I did a character, I was fine. But that wasn't me being shown. If I showed the real me, then it was impossible. I am shocked to hear that that's what Dick Emery was like. Genuinely, that is a shock to me, because you'd never see it. You don't see those nerves, you see this confidence. He was quite anxious. I, watching him in the wings, I, before he went on, I could feel his his nerves before he got on stage. Once he was out there, he was amazing. In the early days, he would be violently ill before a show because the nerves would get to him, but he was he used to pace, he was superstitious. You couldn't, you daren't whistle outside of a dressing room because he would go mad, you know, that sort of thing. Actors and, and people who make people laugh, who are good at comedy mm. and fast, mm. are often very sad people away from the public. Would you say you were a sad person, basically? No, not really. I don't think it's a sadness. I think it's a preoccupation, you know. They're preoccupied with what they're going to do that night, generally, I am. He had this awful, well, it was like Jekyll and Hyde, almost, you know, the, the sad man and the happy man. Mars. Wherever he went, people would adored him. So, hello, Dick, how are you? And everything. wherever he'd go, he'd spread the, his bonhomie. And even if he went home and wept, he was in public. He was very jolly and funny. <laughs> now, do, you, do you find you have to be a comedian sort of 24 hours a day? Oh, no, that would be terribly boring. Now, when I'm off, I'm off. I, I don't want to know about that. I'm a quite a seriously, serious minded. Chap, actually. You don't feel you have to be funny with oh, no, 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 no. no. Yes. One has to sometimes if one is attending a function or something that is expected of you, you know. But um, not generally, no, I don't like that at all. I never saw him with lots of friends. Uh, yes, he went to the restaurant every night, but it was mostly with a, a, an audience that were from the theatre and he would ask them and of course they went whether they wanted to or not because it would have been rude to, to turn the star down. He was capable of immense kindness and also had tremendous charisma. I think people forgave a lot because, you know, he was Dick Emery. Uh, Dick did have emotional issues for which he had therapy from time to time. The only uh, thing that did help Dick with therapy was that one of his doctors said to him, what is it that you actually like to do? And he said, I'd like to fly and be free. And the, so the doctor said, well, why don't you do it then? And so Dick got himself flying lessons and became the pilot that he hadn't managed to become before. Do I think of Dick Emery as a pilot? I think he's an idiot, that's what I think. I mean, flying strictly for the birds, isn't it? I mean, I like birds, you know <laughs> what I mean? But what he does, flying about like that, it's dangerous. It's, it's not natural, is it? We did fly a lot together. Once we went down to the Isle of Wight, which was very scary, the cloud base came down, so it was like driving in fog, basically, and he hadn't got the instrument rating, so he, we had to turn round, and he was... I had Michael, like this, and we had to get back to the... Oh, it was terrifying. <laughs> I took up flying because it takes your mind off show business, 
of the entire world. You get up there and you're miles away from it all. In the 70s, Dick Emery was one of the most loved performers on TV. Hello, darling. So it's astonishing how little of his work is seen today. I think the reason they don't show them is probably because people think, oh dear, that's unacceptable, even if they laugh. I mean, you take the other evening, my neighbour's pussy got stuck up on the roof and I had to climb up and get it down. And I fell straight through into the au pair's bed. That's unbelievable. That's exactly what my wife's solicitor said, didn't you? <laughs> Maybe it was good back in the day, you know, work then. <laughs> Looking back at the sketches now, there is there is a sort of warm feeling of nostalgia and you're sort of laughing at the sort of the cheek of it in a way of like, God, is that really what he was doing? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a Marilyn depiction of um, Marilyn Monroe, the dress blowing up. Uh, it was hysterical. I love doing it. I mean, he was a really big star. Yeah, I was so very excited about working with him, really excited. And his teeth are sort of shining and he's going, oh, and of course I've got my clothes on. Uh, I can't think there's anything wrong with it actually at all. No, I just think it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> You couldn't play those today mm. because it just wouldn't work. Humour's moved on, society's moved on, and it was quite a naive humour at the time, and it's now gone through to being something a little bit more selective, a bit more observational. Some of his sketches were very good, and other ones were maybe not so. Dick Emery's humour was already old-fashioned um, in the 60s. It was never... It was only zeitgeisty during the war, when there was no television. It's sort of archaic when it's at its height. So perhaps he was always out of his time. Ooh! Two pints and half a vat of police milk one. <laughs> you know, bottom tapping and pinching was, were the norm in those days. You know, you didn't... It wasn't a worry. Oh, thank ever for that. What with having to sneak aboard and then hide in there? I hope this cabin you got me is a bit more comfortable. Yeah, I've got one or two minor repairs up, then you can relax. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> so it's really nice seeing that again. Oh, my God, I look good. <laughs> so politically incorrect now. <laughs> but that's what things were like. I, that was it. That was what it was like. Women are either, you know, these kind of matriarchs and very prudish, or they are just incredibly kind of bimboish and silly and nonsensical, or, or you know, you have the battle axe wife at home. It just seemed to be how they were portrayed. But when you hear the audience laughter, there's women there laughing their heads off. What is that? Did they recognise something in themselves? <laughs> Obviously, I don't particularly think this is his strongest work. <laughs> um, but it doesn't make me sort of consumed with rage or to sort of make me hate him or think you have to throw everything out because of that. I think it's of its time. I think, you know, British people like jokes about sex. Therefore, you're going to have a sort of sexy girl every now and again in order to make the joke work. Good, clean, family entertainment. No smut off gentleness. Would you like one, Vicar? Oh, just generous of you. <laughs> Dick didn't get the scriptwriters for his programmes that he should have done. You know, Galton and Simpson were the people that could have written for him, but didn't. They wrote for Tony Hancock and they wrote for Steptoe and Son. Brilliant writers. And he was naughty, he was lazy, because he used to leave his learning of his lines to the last minute, because he wanted to be on his motorbike or doing the things he did. Good afternoon, Miss Dunnett. Oh, hello, Vicar. I see you have two magnificent specimens. <laughs> Pardon? So large and healthy. <laughs> Most of us gardeners would be proud to get our hands on those. Oh, you are awful. But I like you. Dick Henry was brilliant as Vicar, brilliant as Mandy, but he yearned for roles that rewarded his talent as an actor. One of the, the, the great disappointments of Emery's career is he never did more dramatic roles because I think he was a terrific actor. He didn't like being called a comedian. He always called himself a comic actor. But, but really, I think there was something in him that was, that was great acting without being funny. Sometimes people put you in these boxes, and for him, definitely, was, oh, he's such a good character actor. 
let's keep him there. You know, sometimes it doesn't translate to doing a lead role in something else. At the moment, you're heavily engaged in television. Very heavily, yes, yeah. yes. But I understand you're very anxious to go into film. Oh, yeah, I'm dying to get on films. Anybody want, uh, want to get on films? <laughs> Please, I do, yes, want to get on films very badly. I love filming. But is this a sort of Dick Emery becoming a sort of frustrated actor? I'm not a frustrated actor, I'm an actor, I do act. Dick did want to get into films, and um, usually he just had a little part, a small part in other people's films. Um, and then um, he made Oh, You Are Awful, but all his characters had to be in it, which didn't give him much scope. Out in time for the Christmas holidays, a new feature film called Oh, You Are Awful. And as the title might suggest, it stars television comedian Dick Emery in his first major bid for film stardom. It's a very British comedy. It's basically an hour and 40 minutes of, of, um, of an upskirt movie it's him it's him trying to track down the, the the code of a of a swiss bank vault which is tattooed on the bottoms of four dolly birds as they were known in the 70s so it's him hilariously trying to look up their skirts and snatch images of their bums and you know nobody would bat an eyelid back then in the 70s it allows dick henry to uh, embrace that sort of saucy you know carry on style comedy but to uh, employ his beautiful gallery of comedy characters from the TV. Lamprick. Oh, uh, I do beg your pardon, your ladyship. The bird got out of control. Shows how fresh it is. <laughs> Naughty girl. <laughs> if I could just have you to peek. You want me to show you my bum? Oh. So that's where it is, on your bottom. Oh, I might have guessed. You see the problem? I do indeed. The first bit was uh, I was a train announcer at Waterloo Station. So that was the first bit, and I had to announce the, uh, the trains, all the time of the trains. The second bit was uh, that I had a tattoo on my body. <laughs> Is it degrading to women? I suppose it is, but it's quite harmless. Um, and some of it's quite funny. Uh, so it's silly. I think it's silly. I say... Yes? Now I'm up on the stool, I can't reach down to put the money in the slots. Well, you get into position and I'll put it in. All right, ready? I didn't think any harm was done because it's just a silly setup, especially having a tattoo on your backside, is it really? <laughs> Mind you, that's very. Everybody seems to have tattoos everywhere now, don't they? So. <laughs> now we'll just have one more. This time, try not to smile. Now, that is not my bum. I said, I'm so sorry, I cannot do it. I was really. And it was genuine. I just could not go into that position. It felt like porno, so I, that's why I didn't like it but that is awful because i had read the script i should have been able you know to do it and go ahead but they were fantastic and so was dick and he said don't worry don't worry joey it's be all right we'll get somebody else in to do that bit um but it is bad because i'd filmed the first bit and that's not right don't usually do that so uh there was a body double come, came in and shot the backside bit <laughs> So when anyone says, oh, I saw you in um, Oh, You Are Awful, and I say, it's not my bum. <laughs> my scene was I was in a bedroom upstairs and they had the camera through the window, so it was literally just the cameraman and me. There was no, not like an open set or anything, so it was done very nicely, but I still found it deeply embarrassing. <laughs> I've never done a nude scene since. It put me off for life. These days, people do them all the time, but didn't do them very much in those days. It's quite harmless, though, in a way, isn't it? It's, it's, it's more of your McGill seaside humour, really. And it does give him a, a vehicle to do Hetty and Mandy and uh, the Vicar and all sorts of things. But when he's being his character between those characters, he's great. Really good. There, you can see a depth in his acting. You can't con a con man, old son. I practically invented that spiel. The name's Tully. That's... You may have heard of me. Tully? Not Charlie Tully. 
one and the same. As a film showcase for his talents, it's, it's unbeatable. I think you'll find after a few days of regular meals and healthy exercise, you'll feel like a new woman. I practically always do, ma'am. Were you, as a matter of interest, flooded with offers after that, huh? No. <laughs> I find that extraordinary. So do I. Yeah. For Dick's film vehicle to not go as well as he'd hoped was a quite a blow to his ego because he, want, he desperately wanted to get into films. I think, in a way, you, if you put uh, Dick Emery and Peter Sellers side by side, I think that Emery wants to be Sellers, really. He wants his glamour, he wants his success. The act isn't so different, really. It's dependent upon these characterizations. It's dependent upon funny voices. But I think the big difference of what happened with their careers was that Sellers never really did TV. He went straight into films and stuck at it. And without that, you only ever, you, you will always remain just a parochial British star and can easily be quite quickly forgotten. He never again got that chance that you are awful had presented him to, to, to become a star. And that was his best shot, really. And I suppose he didn't tick the boxes for Hollywood. Dick Emery still harboured ambitions for bigger and better acting roles but he could always enjoy the continued success of The Dick Emery Show. The, the characters were so diverse. And, well, we're talking about diversity now, you know. <laughs> they weren't terribly diverse, but within the um, framework of um, a five-foot-five Englishman, they were quite diverse. <laughs> the Bobble Boy was one of those ones that you really remember, but, I mean, even back then, you know, as, like, a 10-, 11-year-old watching it, I did always think, He's actually a very old boy. Can I have a call it, Dad? I think he had a few dads over the years, but Roy Kinnear is the one that everyone remembers. And, and Roy was 20 years younger than Dick Emery. <laughs> also, they were slightly hampered by the fact that it's very hard to do a, a skinhead. <laughs> you can't do a skinhead wig, so he always had a slightly odd wig. <laughs> the thing with the Dick Emery characters is they were all always endearing, so even though he was a skinhead, he was a, he was a crap skinhead. Um, and you were always sort of slightly on his side. This way you can't adopt a kid. <laughs> oh, isn't he gorgeous? Mum, Dad? Of course! Ah. It was almost like he was detached from us, but when he gave you time and he was in your world for that moment, he could light it up completely. When he was being himself, which was so rare, because I think with performers like that, they, they tend to be off in a world of their own a lot of the time, and it's very difficult for them not to perform all the time, but the rare times when he didn't, they were marvellous. I think because of that tremendous closeness to his mother and the fact that she was always there almost until the end of his life, she always took first place, and then the women in his life took second place. His children, sadly, I think some way behind. Rather than being like a dad, he was more like an uncle, I felt, to myself anyway, but I know he was my dad, but we, we were spoiled as well. All right, Henry, you can bring the stuff in now. Sir? Shove them all down there, will you? Certainly, sir. It was like Father Christmas coming at present time, you know, for birthdays and Christmas. He hadn't got a lot of time for children. I've never called anybody dad because I've had a stepfather that brought me up, so I called him Tony, and then and, and Dad. I don't know; it just didn't feel right to me. It's weird. I couldn't just couldn't call him Dad because I don't think he was around enough for me. He turned up one birthday, um, and at that time he had an Aston Martin DB5, like uh, the James Bond car. And he walked in. Hello, here's a present. Where's your mother? Went in the house, patted me on the head, said, "Right, just happy birthday. Goodbye." Gone. I haven't forgotten my lovely daughter. <laughs> there you are, dear. Or a layabout husband. <laughs> Thank you. Dick Emery used a Super 8 camera to shoot home movies. This is Vicky and their children, Michael and Eliza. Yes, this was at Cobham, wasn't oh, it? Grief. And now my vest is hanging out. I know, oh my God, look. Aww. And Mum addressed us like twins, look. <laughs> really? I'm just standing there, I know. It was just a bit of a show, all this, wasn't it, Michael? Absolutely. Look, grabbed their hands, me doing the swinging arm. Yeah. 
you know, weirdly, I have absolutely no recollection of this I whatsoever. I can't remember that either. It's amazing, isn't it? Sweden. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> Your walk, that's brilliant. And we used to get these little visits and then we wouldn't see him for a long time. Yeah. And it was literally. just it was like this guy just one day in and then another year would pass and then we'd see him again, sort of thing. And remember he used to say, Do you love me? Mm. all the time. Oh, he used to ask all the time, yeah. That used to make me and Michael feel really awkward. He used to stand miles away from us and go, Do you love me? Do you love me? And then we'd have to walk to him. Do you remember, Mike? It was it, it was, was really, like a demand rather like than demand, something. Yeah. Was, it, it, it was something that he was trying to, I guess, earn. The guilt. Yeah. Um, and it was very difficult. Very difficult. It's, it's like having that sort of distant relationship with a, an uncle, if you like. When you saw him, it was familiar. It wasn't like a father-son relationship. Um, it was difficult because through the formative years, he just kind of wasn't there. Um, so very difficult to build that kind of father-son bond. The only chat I had with him about actually was about the birds and the bees. I think I was about 14 and he said, because uh, I had a little guy that I liked, and he said, has he got you on the table yet? I said, pardon? You know, like a bit like Mandy, actually. I said, pardon? I beg your pardon. I said, what do you mean? You know, and he said, has he got you on the table yet? And I thought, that was it. And I thought, I said, no, he hasn't got me on the table. And he just walked off. I was like, OK, like you did with you. I was mm. just like... So that was my birds and bees chat. <laughs> Has he got me on the table? Who writ that up there, then? I did, Dave. And you done it lovely. Only don't do it again. <laughs> the Chelsea supporters. Oh, Chelsea, yeah, all right. Have a chance. Oh, it was very strange. I mean, he didn't believe in education. He hauled me out of school. You know, I was halfway through my A-levels. No, you're not doing those. You're leaving. Why? Because I say so. You're not doing, you're finished with education. Dick spent precious little time with his children. And when he did, they weren't always his priority. Dad sort of came in with this young lady. She must have been about 18. Very pretty, you know, lovely, very sexy dress, heels, false eyelashes, very glamorous. And he said, I'll see you guys tomorrow night. I'm going to leave you with the staff. And uh, I was like, wow. Cool. He said, just get room service, order you what order what you want. So me and my brother went, okay. He just left us to our own devices. It wasn't very responsible, but he did get the staff to you know, they were watching us basically, babysitting us. I was probably about seven. Yeah. Crazy. I will see you again, won't I? Someday. I remember we were in the garden of a pub in Shepperton and we'd actually started to get to know each other quite quite late on and he's sitting there and he suddenly turns he says you always call me dad or father you always call me that why and I went um well because you are <laughs> you know as you do and he said yeah but I don't I don't want that I really don't want that what I want is to be your friend I don't want the father crap Gold. It's a Rolls Royce, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> You're going to tell me you bought that and all? No, it's on hire. 100 quid a day with the chauffeur. <laughs> but if I like it, I might buy a couple. And it's sort of like a denial of an entire set of responsibilities. You know, he, he was an odd man. When he got to be well off, he loved to spend his money on the biggest, beaut most beautiful car, the plane, the boat. I think it made him feel, and he needed to be made to feel, that he'd been a success. The trappings were not just trappings to show off, they were comfort, they were comfort things. And he said, I'm a small man, so I need a big car. That was his, that was his motto. It became like a conveyor belt of cars and things like that, because he had the money to do it. And Mum and I used to joke that um, he was changing cars because the ashtrays were full. Yeah, all the time. It was just suddenly, oh, we've got another car. Oh, really? And you couldn't keep up with it, you know. He used to love his cars. Definitely. <laughs> he bought planes, he bought motorbikes, he bought boats, even though he could get, well, he could get seasick in a bath. He was, he was the worst sailor in the world, but he bought a boat, you know. 
banks. No one ever said to him, put money in away, put money into this, put money into that, because now you're earning, put it away. And don't buy the car, do this. Your bank manager to see you, Dad. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lambrick. I think you know why I'm here. And of course, after a while, uh, after five years of doing this, someone asked to see his tax record. That is the Inland Revenue building over there, is it? Mm -hmm. It's because uh, the Inland Revenue were chasing him for unpaid tax. You don't mean you're actually going to shoot one of Her Majesty's tax inspectors from this hotel? Well, I would have thought that was obvious. In that case, may I suggest room 36? You'll have a much better view from there. <laughs> Which is why at the end of his life, when he should have been able to wind down, he was working desperately, desperately hard. And this is a man who, ten years beforehand, in 1972, had had a coronary. Dick had a huge following in Australia and New Zealand. He toured packed houses for months at a time. The box office there helped pay the bills back home. Can we ask you uh, why you graced our fair shores? Well, uh, principally for money. I've, I've come over here to earn a little bit of money. Somebody asked me to come over. Would I like to come over? So I came over. He also did Australian TV. This candid interview hasn't been seen in Britain before. In it, he casts an unforgiving light on his career. Do you think that uh, Dick Emery will go down as one of the great comedians? It doesn't worry me. Uh, I mean, uh, I have so far... No, I didn't say, does it worry you? Do you think you will go down? Oh, well, that, 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 well uh, when I say it doesn't worry me, uh, I, I never think about it. I mean, that, uh, that, that never that occurred to me. Is that entirely honest? Oh, absolutely honest. I have no illusions about this business, you know. None whatsoever. Uh, I consider myself a commodity, like a tin of beans. And as long as the, the, the label's OK, I'm going to go all right. But I'm very, very, very insecure about uh, my position in life. The long trips away gave him time with his mistress, Faye. Dick and I had been together for some time in England entirely secretly. Um, I mean, both of us were married and both of us didn't want to hurt our partners. We just got sort of tied up with each other and it was a whole different thing in Australia because we didn't have to slink away and meet in places. And you know, in England, it was difficult. Supposing we would, had decided to go to a hotel and we're signing in as Mr and Mrs Smith, Dick with his collar up and his dark glasses on, and the person behind the desk says, oh, uh, Mr Emery, can I have your autograph before you... <laughs> it's, you, you it, it sort of spoils it a bit. <laughs> and those moments in Dick's personal life could influence his comedy. Filmed in Australia, this sketch is the perfect illustration. Excuse me, sir, are you staying at this hotel? No, I am not. Damn cheek. I go to book a double room for a bike for myself here. When I go and sign Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, they get all suspicious and chuck us out. Blasted sauce. Rotten weekend this is turning out to be. Well, it's your fault. If you hadn't called me, sir, they would never have guessed. Take a listen. We were in the dressing room after a show, and, um, Dick said, Faye, and I turned around and couldn't see him. He was kneeling on the floor behind me and, and asked me to marry him. And I was so amazed that I said yes. The fact that we both were actually married at the time, um, it was so romantic, we forgot that. <laughs> they never did marry. Back home, Dick tried to patch things up with wife Jo, but he was soon back with Faye. They stayed together as he continued to work as hard as ever. Then, in 1982, the BBC gave Dick a chance to show off his acting talent in his own comedy-drama serial. Dick Henry Presents was the overall umbrella title of it, and the first one was called Legacy of Murder, uh, which teamed him up with the young Barry Evans, who was brilliant in it as his sort of sidekick, and Patsy Rowland. So, so creme de la creme of, of comedy actors to surround him, plus all his other characters too within this sort of crime narrative. Um, and brilliant, brilliant series. Legacy of Murder gave Dick the um, wonderful opportunity for having different characters. His Bernie Weinstock character, he practised the accent for that over and over and over again. Enter! Oh, do take a seat, sir. I won't keep you a moment. 
everywhere we were, I heard him talking to himself in the kitchen, in the bathroom, in anywhere we were while he was driving the car, he'd go into this and practice this accent. I listened to one or two people on television and uh, it sort of came out and he spoke like that, you know. It's very simple, really. And a lot of my Jewish friends who do talk like that. And uh, thus became uh, Bernie Weinstock, you see. <laughs> they did a second series called Jack of Diamonds. It was uh, sort of like a final legacy, really. Well, that was his, his final work, and uh, it was so good. So I think that could have certainly run and run for at least another three or four years. Uh, the Emmy presents um, brilliant, brilliant conceit. What the hell? Filming complete on Jack of Diamonds, Dick headed back to Australia for another payday, but his health was worsening. His last tour of Australia was too much. It wrecked his health. Absolutely wrecked it. Six months tour with one day off, and then that one day he got booked to do a television advert in, to be filmed in New Zealand. Yes, towards the end of Dick's life, when he really was too ill to work, but insisting upon working, he could no longer do his makeup or dress himself or anything. And I used to do his makeup for him, dress him, put his wigs on, get his shoes on, get him to the, to the wings, and then give him his first line and a little push. And that wasn't because I wanted him to go on, it's because that's what he wanted. Towards the end of Dick's life, when he really was too ill to work, but insisting upon working, he did the Spotlight film at the Devonshire Park Theatre in, in Eastbourne. He was just too ill. He, kept, he couldn't breathe. He, his breathing was really bad. But he insisted on going on. When I was 17, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for small town girls on soft summer nights. This is the last time Dick Emery appeared on stage. A heartbreaking performance using the characters he'd created to help tell the story of his own life. My word, that was painful. He was in more and more pain. And he'd had a really bad night. He'd been tossing and turning all night and groaning. And even when he did go to sleep, he was bad breathing and groaning. And he was in um, such a lot of pain. The doctors came and he was immediately taken to the Cromwell Hospital. And it was Christmas Eve, and I took all the presents up with us so that we could open them on Christmas Day, but on Christmas Day, he went into intensive care. We all went up to the hospital, and Joe was there, Faye was there, and of course, I was there, and the children were there, and Nick was there. Um, but he was very, very poorly. Uh, he was, he had the covered eyelids, you know, to keep his lids closed, and he was on drips. I probably saw him about three or four times before he passed. I, to be honest with you, he was unconscious at that particular point, so, and he was just, just not there anymore, so I just held his hand, and I just remember him being very cold. Um, but it was a bit of a fiasco, because Joe kept coming in, and Faye was there, and they, they didn't speak, so it was, it was very awkward. And Joe went off to get some food, and we were like, why are you going to get food at this particular point? So I just wanted to be there with him all the time and hold his hand, which I did. I would have gone in, but I thought it's a farce to have us all, you know, going and saying, oh, hello, oh, Dickie darling, you know, I mean... So I didn't go in. I was in the hospital with him for 17 days. It was a... And all that time, he said, don't tell anybody I'm not well. I'm, I'm, and I said, well, there's a, about a thousand press downstairs. What am I going to say to them? And he said, tell them I've got gout. The comedian of a thousand disguises, Dick Emery, died tonight. He'd been in hospital since before Christmas, but he wasn't thought to be seriously ill until New Year's Eve when he was transferred to an intensive care unit with a respiratory illness. Dick Emery died of cardiorespiratory failure on January the 2nd, 1983. He was just 67. Many of his friends from the world of show business attended the funeral this morning of the comedian Dick Emery. When the hearse arrived at Mortlake Crematorium, the mourners were led by members of his family. Dick's funeral was in parts beautiful, but of course there was tension and uh, it was something to live through that. There was Joe one side, Faye the other, and me at the back. 
And then at the end, Joe got up and kissed the coffin and put a rose on it and Faye didn't. She held back, but three wives at the funeral. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him well, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. My favourite sketch of his is one with him and June Whitfield. And they play the landlord and landlady of a pub. And they win the most loving couple award. Well, what's it going to be? Well, I... <laughs> and they hate each other. Yeah, Keeps the best drop of beer for miles around. Well, I put in a lot of hard work in the cellar, old boy. Yes, he and the barmaid are hardly ever out of it, are you, darling? <laughs> she holds things for him, you know. <laughs> is just brilliant on both their parts. Don't you ever get on each other's nerves? Oh, but heavens, no. Oh, no, no, no. Old Joyce here is always in my thoughts. Whatever I'm doing, whether I'm chopping wood for the fire or... <laughs> His timing is perfect. June Whitfield is wonderful. When that dreadful moment comes for the final parting, I only hope the good Lord takes me first, that's all. <laughs> Look at that. She's choking with emotion at the thought of it, you see. I love it. I love it. I can watch that over and over again and just watch little nuances in it. It's just wonderful to me. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him, the darling. He's absolutely thrilled. Room for a little one, is there? <laughs> <laughs> There's one sketch you do, and the, the guy is just waiting for his train, and he's just talking to him randomly. Train going under a bridge at 60 miles an hour, right? Kiddly dee, kiddly da, kiddly dee, kiddly da, kiddly dee, kiddly. Ah! <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> Lighthouse. <laughs> Turn up, turn! <laughs> he does an impersonation of the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what we are referring to. How dare you rise before your sovereign gives you leave to do so? It's a potty. He shouldn't be allowed out. He... <laughs> Who are you? I'm the station master. Hey. What was all that then? How's my tea break? I think that's probably one of the best sketches I've seen of him, actually. It's brilliant. They don't make characters like that anymore. He was a one-off. One off. I loved him. To have 18 series, 18 series on primetime television, you have to be very, very good at what you do. You know, you saw your dad and mum laugh, and they're laughing out loud, and they were getting bits that maybe I didn't get, you know, at the time. Um, but um, his legacy is definitely laugh-out-loud comedy and great characters. I built a comedy career out of doing exactly what he was doing, and he was a huge influence on, on, on me and Paul Whitehouse and Harry Enfield because we'd all grown up watching that, and we loved that idea of the familiarity of the returning characters. Yeah, without him, you wouldn't have a lot of the kind of newer comics that came onto the scene. You, you know, especially with something like Little Britain, you can see that in the noughties, they were kind of uh, drawing on those sort of characters, those catchphrases, everything, and you can see influences from someone like Dick Emery because they obviously grew up watching him and going, oh, he's a genius. That's his legacy. If you want to know what his legacy is, that's what it is. He's influenced younger people to, to be able to create characters that you can instantly recognize and instantly fall in love with. Uh, you can't underestimate how, how loved he was as a comic. He really was, I mean, nationally loved. And because he was on TV right to the bitter end, you know, it was almost like this... You know, what we're going to do now, we're going to watch now, you know. I wish that he'd gone away knowing that actually he taught a lot of people a lot about character acting, especially within comedy, and he should have been so proud of that. When you really got to know him, he was a very sweet man, and although on occasion it might appear that he was at fault on some things, I just saw a sweetness which was genuine. His hair was always very, very uh, neat. Extremely funny, terrible wind, and actually very lovely, loving guy. Gorgeous. Well, that's it. That's my life. Good night. God bless you.